Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand. And we have something quite unusual for you today. Instead of the individual artists talking about their work, we have two very exceptional people as our guests. And uh, they are scholars and art historians and educators and authors and gallerists. And also, not to say the least, they are collectors, exceptional collectors. We're over at the Spatewood Galleries, right in the center of Upton, Mass, on Route 140. It's very easy to find. We're the guests of Sonia Hansard Weiner and Andy Weiner, who are just astounding collectors. They have over 5,000, what? 9,000 9, works of art which they exhibit regularly in this gallery. And uh, we're very lucky today to be able to uh, get to know them a little bit and also to see some of their collection. So thank you so much for having us here. And thank thank you, you for Sue. coming. Uh, I want to know a, a little bit more about this collection. What's the span of it? Well, our earliest pieces are from the 1480s. And it goes up to pieces we just received some in the mail that were done two weeks ago. So it's which will a, be in the show. a really long period of time yeah. that you, you cover. What, what we are have about 2,000 old master prints and drawings. The rest are 18th to 21st century. So it's mostly prints and drawings? And mostly. Yeah, works but on paper? and Some larger pieces. Yeah, I see you have a lot of large paintings, but it, for, for the most part, prints and drawings and works for the on most paper. Part. And uh, I... I have to say, I'm dying to see some of the old master things. What, what can you show me? Well, we're standing right by some Albrecht Durer woodcuts, as well as an, as well as an engraving. Uh, the interesting thing about this, I discovered a few shows ago. We have a drawing of watercolor by Veronese. And it was reminding me of something. I couldn't figure out what it was. and. As I was walking from one part of the gallery, I noticed we had another piece on the wall. Oh my gosh, yeah. So you have this, this is a brush drawing this with ink? This is a brush drawing. Yeah. And so I did some reading in Vasari, who was my guide for everything. He was a friend of Michelangelo's. And discovered that when Veronese started his career, he copied Durer's woodcuts, and that's how he that's how we learned to and be an Durer's artist. And woodcuts were available to be seen. Yes. And can you imagine that these are woodcuts with these fi fine, fine little lines? The, they were, were they wood engravings? They hadn't done those yet. No? Before Durer, woodcuts tend to be, have lines are about an eighth of an inch. And Durer somehow figured out how to cut wood in such a way that the thin lines wouldn't break. Because when you do a woodcut, yeah. what you cut away is below the surface of the, of the print. You ink what's above the, the surface. And the little raised line can chip off. Yeah. Well, and over the course of time, that usually asking, happens. Yeah. They're amazing and absolutely so beautiful. You have some other, this is a, an ink drawing. And what else do you have here? Well, this is brush. Um, this one is. Oh, how sweet. Well, let's do this one. OK. I notice you have mylar covering all the images. Yes. Just for the protection of the... Mylar is, is um, non-acidic, so it doesn't damage what it touches. Most, most things that you put in front of a, a, a piece of art um, are likely to be troublemakers. Mm -hmm. uh, mylar, we discovered, we, 
We spent many years in Madison, Wisconsin, where I was on the faculty. I was a mm -hmm. professor of English. And when we started seriously doing this, I went to the University of Wisconsin Art Museum, the Elvin New York Art Museum, and said, what do we have to do to keep from going nuts and from destroying our art? And they said, the first thing is only archival materials. So they told us what to get and where to get it. And we started from there. Um, I, a lot of the times I go into a gallery and I see something and I look down at the, the edge and I see it's brown, brown, which mm -hmm. means it's full of, full of wood pulp, which means it's full of acid and it's burning and damaging the work. So the quality of the prints that you collect is very, you're very aware of that. Yeah. Here's a charming <laughs> little head of a baby with, is that just red chalk? This is a draw, live drawing. Yeah. This is not a print. No. Wow, lovely. And who, this is uh, Italian. And then I wanted to show this one, uh, Albrecht Durer. Is this an etching? That's an etching. Yeah. But we have to take the, the mylar off of that. But um, imagine these being circulated before there was, this was printing at its wonderful discovery of technology yeah. of the day. This one is about 1511. Wow. Lovely. So it's older Lovely. than I am. Wow, amazing. So people can see these when they come into your gallery, can't yeah, they? Yeah, they can. You know, I wanted to ask you both, uh, how did you get into this uh, racket? <laughs> <laughs> well, here we were happily living at home. In, in, Ma in Madison. And we were three pack-a-day smokers. We took a 7,000 mile car trip with three little kids in the back seat of a Pinto. They have five kids, by the way. I don't know how they managed all this. <laughs> Go ahead. At the end of this trip, with us smoking three packs a day, they came Each. to us. Each. And said, we're never going to get in the car with you again unless you stop smoking. It's a wonder they're not dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonder we're not dead. <laughs> so we decided we had to stop smoking. So one night, I collected all the ashtrays in the house, and I put them in our white porcelain sink to rinse them out. And the next morning, the water was thick, oily, black gunk. And when we drained it, the sink, white porcelain sink, was black, greasy, nasty. And we said, my god, that's what our lungs look like. Did you ever see that exhibit, the body, where it shows the lungs yeah. in real life? Yeah. That, yeah. Well, what we discovered is the lungs repair themselves. What you rediscovered is that you saved money. We saved money. <laughs> We saved enough money that we could start very gradually buying art. And you were young. And we were young. Just young. So how many, years have you been, how many years have you been collecting? <laughs> well, we started seriously 45 years ago. But the, the other thing is there, you know, you, you had so many uh, life experience as teachers and writers, and uh, that really informs your your awareness and uh, appreciation of the visual arts. It does. That's true. Talk yeah. a little bit about the interdisciplinary thing of... Uh, okay. Well, she was the one who, who knew the arts. I didn't when well, we she, first Well, she had. did her, her uh, PhD work in Renaissance, so you really have and a background for... But, she, but yeah. she did her MFA at a place that was patronized by the de Manil family, and they would bring artists to campus. So she got to meet uh, Rene Magritte. So you Which really we, have yeah. the background too. Yeah. And that was cross fertilization at the University of Wisconsin then. Right. Yes. Yeah. And you were a big part of that program of getting the, the interdisciplinary fields cooperating and appreciating what the other guy was doing. Yeah, there had been a committee who, who did that and it lapsed. And somehow I became the head of the new committee. To, the Renaissance Interdisciplinary Group, so and that was fun. When did you come to this place? We came out to visit our, our older son who teaches yeah. at Wellesley. And after driving 970 miles, we said, we're gonna sleep in this morning. And he came and woke us up and said, no, we have to go see the realtor. And we said, we're not seeing the realtor, we have to sleep, go away. He said, she's waiting in the building, she doesn't have a cell phone, we have to go. But she wanted to show you something. She dra dragged us over. The place she wanted to show us across the street. Oh, she wanted to show you a house. Yes. But instead, they ended up 
buying this terrific church, Church, which is what, 18 something? Built in 1872, stopped being a church in 1987. And you fell in love with the church and Instantaneously. had a vision. When we, 15 seconds after yeah. we walked through the door, we were making an overbid. We knew we were gonna change our lives. And it did change your life forever. I can imagine yeah. your night and day <laughs> with the gallery and the church and maintenance. And Now, um, you do a lot of your business online too, though, Most is that not correct? Most of it? So... Uh, the bulk of it is, is online through the internet and we have people who buy from us pretty much all over the globe. Uh -huh. Australia, China, Europe. Uh -huh. um, Japan. Japan. The Middle, uh, some in the Middle East, I guess we. Mm. Um, You're international. No, we, we have, we have, international. Yeah. We actually have more customers in Germany and England than we do in Massachusetts. That's amazing. Mm. Well, you know, we I think you were a well-kept secret in this area. I have to tell you, I knew nothing about this gallery. I complete, somebody just told me about it, and when I came here, it blew my mind. But you are open to the public. And people can come in and browse through Rembrandt or browse through Miro or whatever. Um, you know, it's amazing. They have boxes and boxes and boxes of archival uh, storage. So you should really come over and take a look. Um, so a lot of your business is done online. Right. Now, you also do exhibitions here. Is that correct? Like we do. Like how many... Uh, it depends. We, we try not to do them more often than, than once every two months, usually every, every three months. Now, do you have to, openings to ha and invite people? or? Well, we're yeah. about to have an opening invite people because we're featuring an artist who lives in Massachusetts. Ah, but I see. It, didn't, it, you know, it hardly pays to do an opening to I announce understand. that you can come and see the works of some dead guy yeah, or some dead woman. Yeah, I understand. Woman. I understand. Well, um, but we'll do a special event for what are some Margaret of the Withers. Margaret Withers, is that the one coming up? Yeah. And when does that come? Uh, it'll be on the wall tomorrow. They're in the process right now of putting up a new show, which opens up tomorrow, and you can stop in and see the Margaret Withers show. Well, it's, uh, it's she's one of, of many. One it's of many. She's getting the, that and that. The, the this is our surrealism so show. She'll have, she'll have 11 see, or 12 her work pieces in the fits show. nicely, even though. So the topic of this coming show is surrealism, yes. and you'll yes. draw from your own collection right. plus her. That's mm -hmm. nice. Okay. So what are some of the shows you've done? You're doing like five or six shows, a, four or five shows a year. Four or five shows. What are some of the shows that you've done in the past? The one that we just finished uh, was actually a kind of uh, eclectic show that was a that did uh, the range of the works we have, starting, as you see here, with I the see. Durer. We had Chagall on the walls. We had old master drawings. We had uh, Picasso and uh, Matisse and, and mm -hmm. others. And we also had uh, Anthony Tapies and, and German Expressionists, uh, which um, include Kathy Kollwitz. Okay. So what do we have here, Sonia? This wall is a wall of German Expressionists, and like the Surrealists, the German Expressionists evolved or grew out of a response to the, the First World War and the devastation that it wrought, as well as the social conditions that existed afterwards. Among the people who are most uh, sometimes associated with that is Kathy Kollwitz. And uh, though many people know her best through the self-portraits that she did throughout her life, she did a series of self-portraits uh, beginning at very young all the way to her old age. Isn't that stunning though? It has so much pathos and it, now is this a lithograph? Yes. I, it, it looks like a rough yes. lithograph crayon. It looks like a real drawing. Yes, this is a lithograph. Beautiful. Um, in, and what you said about the pathos, Colvitz, these up, up here you see two other works of hers that in fact depict some of the horrors. This is uh, people banded together in poverty and, and uh, she Extreme suffering. It is suffering. And she and herself had a terrible, 
pains in, of uh, losing her son, you said? Yes, her son died during World War I and her grandson in World War II. So she lost people personally, but more to that effect because, because these works and the self-portraits in a way are a pair because she chronicled the atrocities and the pain and the suffering that had been there. But she, as, as she said to, and, and you can see in this, er, in this early one, the pain of that was so great that she had to cover her face. Oh, that, so beautiful. And yet later in the self-portraits, she brings herself straight forward and we see her fully uh, looking at what she says. Look at the line in that, how it grabs and scratches and, oh wow, that's what you call expressive mark making. Yes. Beautiful. She was asked later in her life how it was that she could depict this level of violence and, and yet maintain her own self. Mm. And she responded because she saw the world with loving eyes. And I think the that love we see, of humanity. We the see love of humanity. her loving eyes just for, looking at everything. This, this is just an aside, but I love looking at the different print media and seeing how they have different voices. Like this, using the side of the crayon on the stone probably, is, has such a softness and a sadness because of the material. And then you go to this one with that scritchety, scratchety, stabbing kind of line. And w what is that? It's an etching? etching? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see how the material plays such a big part of what's being said and how the artist can use that to their advantage. Beautiful. Oh, so we should probably move on and look at some more things. There is more Miro in this show than any other artist because I love Miro. Miro is my favorite 20th century artist. Uh, this, this wall combines works from th four different periods, um, 1960, 1961, 1971, and these are in the 40s. Uh, this is a very rare set. Miro did a, a book with a friend of his, Tristan Zara, who was a Dadaist poet. And the final version had small hand painting additions to each of the pages. So in other words, this is the initial print. This is the trial proof. And then if you'll notice, these are the exact same image except that. He has added hand painting. So that no two of these are ever going to be identical. So each one is kind of unique. Yeah. Amazing. It didn't another th I'm, I'm sorry, another thing about this, normally prints are square or rectangular. This is the only set that I've ever seen by Miro or basically anybody else where the plates were cut to, to a given shape. There's not a single right angle in any of these, any of these pieces. Hmm. So he's taken geometric sort of people things and just so, let his fancy go loose. So the plate is where the pressure is indicated yeah. on the edge of that yeah. shape that one single shape in the middle. That's so the plate he's saying mark. the plate was cut to fit the drawing and then printed. Amazing. I you know, I didn't notice that when you said it. I was wondering about why they looked so embossed, but that explains it. Yeah. And just the freedom of the hand painting is just so wonderful to me. They're crazy. They oh I love them. They're beautiful. Well thanks. Those are great. I see you have tons of books here and I understand these are for sale? A lot of them are for sale. Wow. We have in the building over 22,000 books. 22,000 books? Books, remember, books are my life. You know, I taught 16th century poetry and prose. I taught 17th century. I ta taught a class that went from Beowulf to um, a 20th century version of it called Grendel, in which the monsters Oh were my gosh. But basically, I taught in the 16th and 17th centuries. I taught Shakespeare at least once a term. This assortment of books is something to die for. I'm buying this one, ten dollars. I, I love books, and I just can't. I can't live without books. And it's, at some point, we said, "This is crazy. Why don't we just get books for people to buy? Because nobody else sells decent books." 
So we started buying books that relate to the work that we have so that people who are interested can do follow-ups on it. So we have more surrealist works here. Yes, these are surrealists. And one of the things, Sue, that is important to me about the surrealists is that of the t major 20th century movements, this is the one where male and female were united, where they had more or less an equal partnership. You had Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning, K. Sage and Eve Tangi. Um, you had, you know, Lee Miller and uh, and and Man Ray, uh, Andre Breton and Elisa Breton. Real partners. Real partners. Salvador Dali and Gala, they were real partners. They who were more than just a muse, and and as a as a group, then they developed a unique ex way of moving out of that awful chaos and horror of war and trying then to explore and find a different way to make sense of the world. You have such an amazing collection here. I'm just wondering what drove you all these years and prompted the selections you made? I think it was love. It was something we did together. I don't think we very often, one of us or the, or the other has ever bought anything without talking about it with our partner. Um, we discovered that most of the things that we, one of us likes, the other likes also. We are a marriage of true minds. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> There's also something just um, amazingly fulfilling about living a life around art. You know that because you're an artist. That this building is the culmination of, in many respects for us, because it provides a sacred space for what I think are sacred works. Right, the, the good ones are always sacred, aren't they? Yeah. Well, yes. I, I don't know how to draw to a close because there's so much more I'd love to talk about, but I do want to thank you for uh, having us. And I also want to invite you to come down and see the Spatewood Galleries uh, in the center of Upton and meet Sonia and, uh, Andy. Talk, and Andy and talk about uh, their work. It's a wonderful experience. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas.